Okay, so welcome to lecture 11 on toric varieties. So in one of the discussion sessions, uh, somebody surmised that a toric variety is a subvariety of a torus, but that's not actually true. So a subvariety of a torus is called a very affine variety. A toric variety is something that's bigger than a torus. It's something that completes a torus. So for example, the torus itself, affine space, projective space, products of projective spaces, all of these things are examples of toric varieties. So toric varieties gives you a repertoire of spaces that make a, a torus bigger, in which uh, the very affine varieties naturally embed and get completed. We are starting with an n-dimensional lattice, capital N, uh, which is a free abelian group of rank N, and then the, the lattice dual M. So in Literature on toric geometry, M and N are standard notation. This is something that's good to get used to. So there are two lattices, N, and the dual lattice, M. Then there is the uh, associated torus, T to the N. That's N tensor K star. So this is uh, the same as hum from M into k star, and in coordinates, this is the torus k star to the n. Now this tensor product here and in the lines that follow is in the category of abelian groups. So n is an additive abelian group, a z module. k star is a multiplicative abelian group, z module. And then the tensor product is in the category of z module, the free abelian groups. And then uh, since m is dual to n, um, the tensor product becomes the hum. So that's the n-dimensional torus. K throughout uh, will be a valued field. Um, I'm not going to say much about this, but uh, the usual hypotheses were appropriate, so K is a field with, with valuation. Now the data that uh, defines a toric variety, an abstract toric variety, is a rational polyhedral fan, sigma, in the real vector space, n sub r, so this is the real vector space spanned by the lattice n, and in this notation we can write this as n tensor r, so same again, tensor product of two abelian groups, and in the usual coordinate sense this is r to the n, so we have a rational polyhedral fan, finite collection of uh, convex cone that's fit together nicely and can be defined over the rational numbers. And with such a fan, there are two constructions, two main constructions. Of the associated toric variety. So the associated toric variety x sigma, and uh, so this is a variety that contains t to the n. Okay, so this is a completion somehow of the uh, of the torus. So sigma is a fan, and x sigma is an abstract, non-embedded, abstract algebraic variety over k, which I'm about to define or describe. Now, the two constructions that you will find in textbooks, so there's an older uh, construction that's given by gluing local charts. Okay? Now, geometers, topologists like local things. People love calculus, they love gluing local charts, so a toric variety is something that's glued locally from charts, and uh, that's how I learned first toric geometry, but it's, I find it a bit inconvenient. Okay, so I will not describe this here. Um, the other construction is a global quotient construction, and this is the one I will describe. Um, that's a, a bit more recent, and this was really popularized by David Cox a couple years ago. So I will tell you now how you can construct a, an arbitrary, essentially arbitrary n-dimensional toric variety by the global quotient construction. Okay, let me introduce a matrix V. 
So this is you know v1, v2 up to vs and I'm going to take the transpose so these vi are going to be row vectors. So this is going to be an integer matrix of size s by n. So I have n row vectors of length n and these are the first lattice points on the rays. Okay, so the fan has a finite collection of rays, say uh, n rays, and then the vi's are the uh, first lattice point emanating from the origin along a ray, so a ray is a one dimensional cone. Okay, and these are s rays, and I picked the, the generators, v1 up to vn. Now, I'm, we'll assume sometimes in the book, we're assuming that the vi, um, they, they uh, so the, the vi that lie in a given cone, let me say it like this, that lie in a given cone are part of a basis of z to the n. Okay, so by this I mean the following. So think about s as bigger than n. Maybe n is 3. Right? We're in three dimensional space and s is 15, so we have 15 rays. We pick the first lattice point on each ray. Now this fan has a bunch of cones, so maybe it has a triangular cone. So we pick these first three lattice vectors, so there's v4, v7, and v9 are these vectors. Now they span R3 as a vector space, but they generally do not span R3 as a lattice, right? They span R3 as a lattice if the determinant, the 3 by 3 determinant is plus or minus 1, and sometimes we assume that, and uh, if this is assumed, then the toric variety will be smooth. Okay? So if you look at the ray generators lying in a particular cone, and if this is either a basis of z to the n, or in the lower dimensional case, part of a basis, then this toric variety will turn out to be smooth. And for some of the things I will say, this is a technical hypothesis, but I don't want, it to, want you to be distracted by this. Okay, so now with such a toric variety, there is an associated Cox ring so introduced by uh, David Cox. And to describe the uh, global construction, I will introduce the Cox ring. The Cox ring is simply a polynomial ring over our field in variables x1 up to xs, okay, 1 up to xs, graded by an abelian group, and we're going to grade this by the co-kernel of the matrix V. And the grading says that the variable xi has degree ei, okay, so we're in a multi-graded setting. So recall that uh, V is a, an S by N matrix, right? So the co-kernel is the Z to the N modulo the column lattice, right? So it has the unit basis vectors E1, E2, up to ES as generators. And then being the co-kernel, we work modulo the columns of V. And then uh, this is an abelian group given by generators and relations. This abelian group may have torsion, it could have torsion. It doesn't have torsion under this hypothesis, but in general this, this could have torsion, this abelian group. And we're going to use that to give a grading to the uh, polynomial ring. Now uh, somebody walked just in who is enrolled in the Hartshorn class. So, uh, so in Hartshorn chapter 2, this will play the role of the Picard group. Okay? So on the abstract toric variety we're about to construct, this will be the Picard group of the toric variety. Okay, so next thing that we need is the irrelevant ideal. That's an ideal in this polynomial ring. And the irrelevant ideal is called B, and it's generated by products. So I take all Vi not in a given cone sigma, I multiply the corresponding xi, and then I take all sigmas inside the 
fan. So sigma is any cone inside the fan. For any cone, you take the product of the other variables, right? So my fan has 15 rays in three space. So for any cone, I take the other variables that are not in this cone. And then I take the square free monomial I get by multiplying them. And, uh, and that's a square free monomial ideal called the irrelevant ideal. Okay, that's the irrelevant idea. Now here it suffices to take the maximal cones, right? If you take a lower dimensional cone, then this would be a larger product, right? So if I'm a face of you, then uh, me being smaller than you, I contribute a larger monomial, one that's a multiple of your monomial, so therefore I'm redundant, okay? My monomial is redundant. So this lives inside this polynomial. So this looks like a harmless polynomial ring, but the structure, there's a structure to this polynomial, and the structure is the grading and the irrelevant ideal. Okay? So the Cox ring comes to you, it's just a polynomial ring, nothing fancy kind of polynomial ring, but it has an important structure. It has the grading and it has the irrelevant ideal. That's part of the data. And now we're ready for the definition. Here it is, so the definition of the toric variety x sigma can be described as follows. Um, oh, I guess I forgot one more thing. Sorry about this. Well, let me write down the definition, then I'll fill in what's missing. So the toric variety is the s-dimensional affine space with coordinate ring given by x coordinates x1 up to xs. Then you remove the uh, variety of the irrelevant ideal, so this is an open subset of the f-dimensional affine space, and then you mod out by another torus H that I meant to introduce but simply forgot to write down, so I will give it to you now. So H, where? H is the group HOM from the grading group, from the Picard group, the co-kernel of our matrix, so this is a abelian group, free in the smooth case, potentially with torsion otherwise, and we're homing this into K star. That by general linear algebra is the kernel of V transpose tensor K star, right? It's always good to practice, right? To go between tensor product and, uh, and hom on the duality, and then you're ready for extentor unless, like me, you're homologically challenged. Okay, so there's HOM from the co-kernel into K star, but then the dual of this co-kernel is the kernel of the transpose, so we can tensor this with K star. So uh, this is a subtorus of K star to the S, the S-dimensional torus, the large torus, S is much bigger than N, and this acts, let me write it like this, of k star to the s, and this acts naturally on a s, okay? So this is the, uh, the situation, and uh, this comes with a, with a natural action, right? So the kernel of V transpose lies in, is a sub, is a sub lattice of the n-dimensional lattice. So therefore this is a K, it's a sub, sub torus of K star to the n, right? Again, tensor product of abelian groups. Okay, so this is how you give a toric variety by the abstract global quotient construction starting from an arbitrary rational fan. Let's see an example. Um, maybe I'll do the example here, then we don't eclipse the definition. So here's an example. So in this example, n will be 2 and s will be 4. As I said, s is always uh, bigger than n, typically. So let me tell you the fan. So I'm going to give you v. So v is the matrix 1, 0, minus 1, 0, 0, 1, 0 minus 1, I take the transpose, so that's a 4 by 2 matrix. And then the fan that I'm going to be interested in looks like this. 
it's in the plane. Okay, so I take this collection of nine cones in, uh, in R2, right? So one zero dimensional cone, four one dimensional cones, and four two dimensional cones. That's my fan. And you notice that the columns here that you see are the first lattice points, right? So here the first lattice point is 1, 0, minus 1, 0, 0, 1. 0 minus 1. Right? So, so these are the columns of this uh, V transpose. And so this is my fan, it's my sigma. Now I should add this sigma happens to be the normal fan of a convex polytope. It's called this P. Okay, so here is uh, the square. This is the normal fan of the square, and uh, this is the first hint that the abstract toric varieties introduced in this book are somehow related to the very concrete elementary toric varieties in invitation to nonlinear algebra, those concrete toric varieties that rule the world. They are given by a polytope, but in the abstract setting then we would work with the normal fan. Okay, so moving on, so in this case the Cox ring is a polynomial ring in four variables, x1, x2, x3, x4. So I'm now in the process of building a toric surface. So, so this red fan describes some mysterious toric surface which I'm about to construct using the global quotient construction. So I'm starting with the polynomial ring in four variables x1 up to x4, one for each of the red rays. Um, the co-kernel in this case is torsion free. The co-kernel of V is Z2, right? So the co-kernel of the transpose, you can see the non-zero two by two minors all plus or minus one. So when you do integer linear algebra, the first thing you do is you run the Smith normal form, right? So Somebody hands you an integer matrix and the normal form you compute is the Smith normal form, so this shows that the co-kernel is Z2. Uh, the grading, so the grading, so the degree of X1 is equal to the degree of X2, right? So, well, the degree of this is E1 and the degree of this is E2, but they are the same in the co-kernel, mod the uh, columns here, right? The, the first column of the matrix V gives us the relation that says they're equal. So in this identification, the degree of these two things is uh, 1 comma 0, and then the degree of the other two variables is the other unit vector, x3 and uh, x4 has degree 0 comma 1. So after this identification, and prior to this identification on the left side, this would degree would be E1, E2, E3, and E4. As we uh, seen this in the definition, um, where's the grading? Here, okay, grading by EI. Okay, uh, the irrelevant ideal. Okay, let's construct the irrelevant ideal. Well, we have to look at these cones. Let's label them. So, so this was one, two, three, four. Okay. So let's, we only need the maximal cones, right? The ones that you represent. I'm a lower cone. I'm not needed, right? So there are four maximal cones. So, uh, so for example, let's take the cone spanned by 2 and 4, so we're supposed to take the product of the variables that are not called 2 and not called 4, right? so that's x1, x3, and then moving around uh, counterclockwise we get x1, x4, x2, x4, and then the first quadrant gives us an x2, x3, okay? So now we're set, right? We have a polynomial ring and four variables. It has the grading, the Z2 grading, and we have the relevant ideal. And now we can run this construction of getting the, uh, the toric surface. So what is the variety? 
of B. So I claim the variety consists of two planes as the union of the plane given by the last two coordinates and the first two coordinates and you see this by computing the primary decomposition. Well, it's a radical ideal, so it's really a prime decomposition. So this is x1, x2 intersected x3, x4. And this describes the variety where the first two coordinates are zero. And this describes the plane where the last two coordinates are zero. So then the next thing, we need a4 minus VB, right, so this is this parenthesized thing on the left prior to taking some quotient. So let me rewrite this a little bit. So if I rip out this plane and that plane from four space, what I get is A2 minus the origin, so the plane minus the origin squared, right? So this is this pinched plane times another copy of the pinched plane you can see these two things are the same, right? And now I claim that uh, x sigma in this example is a very familiar space. It's p1 times p1. Well, since h, the, uh, the torus h is simply s comma s t comma t, in k star to the fourth. So this is, you know, k star squared embedded in this form. And this acts naturally here. And we recover p p1 times p1. Right? So p1 by definition is a2 minus the origin modulo scaling and the s scales on the first two factors and the T scales on the last two factors. So this gives us a compact toric surface called the product of two projective lines. And uh, the picture of the cartoon is the square, is the polytope that, that gives this toric variety. But you can take any toric variety, right? I mean, if you don't like, you know, if you don't like this ray, uh, the fourth ray, zero minus one. Oh, I guess I messed up, sorry. Let me fix this. Uh, <clears throat> I guess this should be three and this should be four. So if you don't like, you know, the third ray, which is zero, one, maybe replace it by one, five, right? So we replace it by some other ray and then you get a different abstract toric surface. Okay, so this was the 22 minute review of toric geometry. There's a thick textbook, as I said, by uh, Cox, Little, and Schenk. And uh, this will tell you all about toric geometry in its many, many forms. Now the next point that I like to make is that everything in sight tropicalizes. Let's maybe do this here. Perhaps we'll keep this and I'll continue here. So everything tropicalizes. Everything I said tropicalizes. So I claim you can construct a tropical toric variety by doing exactly what I said, verbatim, except every step you do the tropical thing. So let's see how this goes. So, so first of all, what happens if we take k star? So what happens if we tropicalize k star? Well, call this r, okay? So, well, so what I mean, it's really the image of the valuation, which officially should be the value group, but we've always taken the closure, right? So when we stated the structure theorem, the fundamental theorem, we said, let's take the closure. Another way we could do is we could enlarge the field so that r is the value group, in any case, tropicalization of the one-dimensional torus is R, right? So this one-dimensional multiplicative group tropicalizes to this one-dimensional additive group, okay? Now what's the tropicalization of the affine line or of the field? Well, the tropicalization of K is R together with the valuation of zero, which is plus infinity, which is our 
additively neutral element in the min, min plus semi ring. Let's move on. So therefore what's the tropicalization of the affine space AS? So we take everything here, everything on this board we tropicalize it. So tropicalization of affine space therefore is R bar to the S. I'm going to call this R bar. R bar is the extended real number, so it's the real numbers together with infinity. So the affine line tropicalizes to the extended real numbers, and the affine space of dimension S tropicalizes to S copies of the extended real numbers, R bar to the S. Um, how about the tropicalization of H? Right, so for any torus, and we tropicalize to a appropriate uh, direct sum of copies of R, but uh, we can say this as follows. So let's take the kernel of Z, V transpose, and we simply tensor this with R again as an abelian group. So it's verbatim the same as uh, here. So we simply take this formulation except here we replace k star by its tropical version which is r. Right? So this multiplicative group here becomes the additive group. In some sense things become simpler no? because we're taking the product, tensor product of two additive abelian groups. So as always, you know, tropical, tropicalization simplifies things as you know from Pascal's triangle and the binomial theorem. Okay. Um, what else? So then, uh, well, we can also talk about the tropicalization of the variety of the irrelevant ideal. So I claim in our example, let me say this for the example, this becomes all points of the form infinity, infinity, something, something, union, um, something, something, infinity, infinity. So this is the tropicalization here. So these are two two-dimensional sub-objects. I'll explain a little bit more. I'll say a little bit more about tropical varieties over extended real numbers in a moment. But once you believe this, we have the very same definition so of a tropical toric variety. It's simply applying the global quotient constructions exactly as before. So the tropical toric variety is, you know, tropicalization of s-dimensional affine space. So over there, minus the uh, tropicalization of the variety of the irrelevant ideal, and then you mod out by the action of an additive group, trop H, which we defined over there. Okay. So the uh, Cox ring construction, the global quotient construction is exactly the same, except you replace K star by R and then you keep going. Okay. Those are called tropical toric varieties. Let's uh, see how this works in our example. <clears throat> So if according to this recipe we want to uh, construct the tropical toric surface given by this red fan, this would be uh, R bar to the fourth, right? that's what we get here, minus the uh, tropical variety of the irrelevant ideal. So this is R4 minus uh, all points that look like this. You remove boundary points of this form, infinity, infinity, anything, anything, and anything, anything, infinity, infinity. And then uh, you mod out by the action, natural action of uh, additive action of the tropicalization of this group, right? So simply you have the same thing, but now it lives in uh, in the additive version. So this is, let me write it out like this. So modulo, say this in English, modulo um, trop H 
which in this case is the additive group R2 plus, and this equals <clears throat> TROP P1 times P1, which is TROP of P1 times TROP of P1, and this is the direct product of two line segments, so this is exactly P, okay? that's the compact square, right? so this is line segment times line segment. Okay, so that's how it works. Now it's always good when you look at this to ask every object, do you live in M or do you live in N? Right? The tropicalization you know, of the toric variety, well, the poly, that is the polytope, this sort of lives in, uh, this is M, okay? The fan lives in N, so there are M objects and N objects, and it pays to pay attention and not identify this too quickly, um, but I'm going to add something here, so since the tropicalization of the projective line, right, so this is really, we can apply the same quotient construction, this is R2 mod R1 union infinity star, star infinity, right, so you take the uh, tropical torus and then you add two points at infinity, right? that's called a line segment. So what you now see this R1, mod R1, that we've carried through the entire book and every lecture is really a very, very special case. This is really the H, right? So we sort of carried around the R1 all along in the presence of homogeneous equations, in the presence of tropical polytopes and convexity, but it becomes quite systematic from this point of view. So R1 just happens to be a one-dimensional version of the additive group H, which is the tropicalization of uh, a torus, and this is two points, right? so we're adding two points. Now there's something interesting about this polytope, we'll see that the, uh, the tropical curves, plane curves, lives inside. This is really a compactification of the plane and it has a funny metric, it has an integral structure and it has a funny metric. And this takes a little getting used to. So thinking about the projective plane or the product of two projective lines, it takes a little getting used to and uh, that will happen on Tuesday. So there will be exercises about, you know, thinking about this on Tuesday. So Marvin and uh, Maddie Brandt will, uh, will do that. But uh, I will move ahead and do something else now. <clears throat> what we're going to do now is we're going to generalize the fundamental theorem. But first let's talk about hypersurfaces. So let's generalize hypersurfaces from um, Rs, tropical space, to R bar S. Now, 34 minutes in, this is the moment to reboot. So if what I said so far with all the homes and tensor products didn't make any sense to you, you can start afresh. Reboot. A lecture might as well begin here. So R is the real numbers. R to the S is what you think it is. And R bar is the extended real numbers. I'm throwing in a formal element plus infinity. And I want to talk about tropical hypersurface. So we all know tropical hypersurface here, minimum is attained twice. Now we're going to do tropical hypersurfaces there. And uh, so they are defined by polynomials. Let's say Laurent polynomials, but let's take a polynomial just for simplicity. Cu to the x to the u, and this is in s. Maybe that's very bad notation. Oh, it's s, same s actually. We have variables x1 up to xs, and it's a polynomial. But I want you to think about this polynomial as an infinite sum over all infinitely many lattice points in n to the n. 
It just so happened that most of the coefficients are zero. Okay? I like you to think about a polynomial as an infinite sum, but all but finitely many of the coefficients happen to be zero. But same old polynomial. Okay? So then the tropical polynomial, so trop f at w is exactly the same as before, is the minimum of the valuations c u plus w u, where u is n to the n, and we do this for all infinitely many lattice points in n to the n. So, so almost all of these elements are plus infinity. Right? So almost always this is inf because the coefficient is zero, then this becomes plus infinity. Right? So, so this is the tropical polynomial. All but finitely many coefficients are plus infinity. Okay, so same old tropical polynomial. Not nothing new, just we're thinking about it a little bit differently. Let's do an example, just to make sure we're on the same page. So let's take a monomial, x1 times x3. Now back in the old interpretation of tropical geometry in R to the S, this doesn't give us anything interesting, but now I claim it gives us something interesting, so in the extended formulation. So the tropicalization of F evaluated at W, so I'm, I chose this monomial because this is my first generator here in the irrelevant idea. Right? The goal is to tropicalize the irrelevant variety. So, uh, so what's that? So that's the minimum of w1 plus w3 and infinity. Right? And I mean, this is a set, but as a multiset, you have infinity, 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 infinity for all other terms other than x1, x3. Right? So, so the extended tropicalization evaluates at a vector w to the minimum of w1 plus w3 and infinity. Okay? Now both of these things could be attained, right? So, um, so the tropical variety, let's complete this here. So the tropical variety of f is the set of all w in r bar to the fourth, where the minimum is attained twice. And this is infinity star 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 union star star infinity star. Right? It's a union of two hyperplanes uh, at infinity in the extended four-dimensional space. Right? Why is that? Well, suppose I take such a point. So this says the w1 coordinate is infinity and everything else is, can be whatever it wants to be. Okay? Well, I plug this in. Well, then if that, so now watch this, right? w1 is infinity. Okay? You with me? w1 is infinity. So w1 plus w3 is infinity. Now we take the minimum of infinity and infinity, and that's attained twice. Okay? So therefore, Every point of this form is in the extended tropical hypersurface, and so is every point over there. Right? So we have this long list of coefficients. A few of them are real numbers. Many of them are infinities. But it could happen that the minimum is attained twice and is infinity. So that's OK. Right? OK, so now everything works as before. <clears throat> So initial forms, in WF of a polynomial, and initial ideals, in WI, extend to vectors w that are allowed to have infinity among its coordinates. So everything we did in sections 2.4, 2.5, 2.6, the Grobner complex, everything extends to the setting to the extended real numbers because now we can talk about initial ideals and then initial forms and uh, in this sense um, everything extends. So then we have an extended fundamental theorem.
6 to 15. It says the following. So this is for, you state it like this. So it's a theorem for subvarieties of the s dimensional affine space and their ideals in the polynomial ring in s variables. And we get tropical varieties trop v of i inside the tropical affine space. And the tropical affine space is s copies of the extended real number. So everything I said here about this generalization extension is pretty straightforward. So I did two things so far in this lecture. I gave an introduction, a rapid, rapid introduction to arbitrary abstract toric varieties by way of the global quotient construction. And I argued that the same construction works verbatim if we tropicalize the ingredients in this cake. Then I said, let's reboot. Let's simply, you know, talk about minimum is attained twice. And I said, minimum is attained twice. And the fundamental theorem, all is fine, you know, if you allow zeros in the classical field and if you allow infinities in, in the tropical setting. Okay? So now let's combine the two. So now I'm going to combine the two. We get the following corollary. 6 to 16, that says let's start with a variety y of an arbitrary toric variety x sigma. And for some parts of this, I like to assume it's smooth, okay? just for simplicity. So x sigma is a smooth, not necessarily compact, just some smooth toric variety. And why is any subvariety? Now, how do you communicate this variety to your friends or your computer, who might be your friend? You do that by sending an ideal. So this is the homogeneous B saturated ideal in the Cox ring. So the, uh, the global quotient construction and the harmless looking polynomial ring S we use to set this up serves the purpose of speaking about subvarieties that are just given by ideals in the Cox ring. But these ideals should be homogeneous in our grading by the co-kernel of V. Okay, so this is homogeneous in the grading we gave and it's saturated with respect to B. So this is familiar territory in projective space. So if you take your first course in projective geometry, last chapter in cox loche first chapter in Hartshorn, then you know that subvarieties of a projective space are given uniquely by homogeneous ideals in the familiar one-dimensional grading that are saturated with respect to the irrelevant ideal. Right? So in your projective geometry class, the irrelevant ideal is generated by x1, x2 up to xs, but here we have a different notion. So the data is always a Cox ring with a grading that lets us speak of homogeneity and an irrelevant ideal. So that's how we communicate subschemes, and uh, likewise sheaves will be given by modules that are saturated and homogeneous. Now, uh, theorem content of the theorem is that then. Trop y, I'm going to state this a little bit loosely, is correctly given as trop v of i modulo h. Okay? So what I mean, the precise statement I want to say is that taking up describing varieties in this form commutes with tropicalization. 
Right? So I can either carry out the uh, toric variety construction tropically and then, you know, take the uh, take the toric, take this uh, description here with the extended formulation or you know I can work in the toric variety first and take the sub variety there and everything is compatible. Okay, so I'm going to give this a little bit of a loose statement so this lets us talk about uh, tropicalizations of varieties, sub varieties of a torus. I have one more theorem to go and a question to ask. <coughs> Okay, so here's the theorem, might be the main theorem of this section. So, so in section 6.2, and this is theorem 6.2.18. So now let's start where we always started. So Z is a subvariety in T to the N, and so in the torus, and Z bar its closure. in a toric variety. X sigma. So this is the classical Zariski closure in the, for a classical subvariety of a torus. Right? So I have a field K, the piadic numbers, or maybe the algebraic closure of the piadic numbers. I have a classical subvariety of the n-dimensional torus given by a ideal Laurent polynomial ring, and I take its closure in the Zariski topology in X sigma. So X sigma by construction contains T to the N, so we can, as a dense open subset, so we can take the closure. This is the Zariski closure, okay? So then, <coughs> the tropicalization of Z bar equals the Euclidean closure, This is the usual Euclidean closure from your first class in analysis of point set topology, okay? So tropicalization of C bar is the closure of trop Z in R to the N in trop X sigma, okay? That's a very powerful statement. It says the risky closure tropicalizes in the historic setting. Right? So, well, this is simply minimum is attained twice. These are the familiar tropical varieties in Rn, not the extended real numbers, in the real numbers. So these are the tropical varieties that are output by GFAN that we understood two weeks ago. Okay? Now, if we take Rn and we put it inside R bar n with the obvious topology, and then we take the closure just as polyhedral sets. Then we get some set. And I claim that that set is equal to the tropicalization as defined of the Zariski closure in the toric variety. Okay, so that's the theorem. So. Okay, so what am I saying? Well, let's say, let's take a tropical line in the real plane. So this is the tropicalization of the torus. So you see a hyperplane arrangement, and this is a, an arrangement of three zero-dimensional hyperplanes in a one-dimensional space. Okay? That's the Bergman fan, the cartoon thereof. But now let's put this inside a tropical toric variety. Okay? Now the tropical toric variety in this case is the compact, it's the compact square, right? That's the tropicalization of P1 times P1. as constructed by the tropicalization of the quotient construction. And now the tropicalization of some compact, now the line in P1 times P1 is a compact curve. The tropicalization is a compact polyhedral space. And you go out far, 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 far in southwestern position and you add in one more point. And you add one more point here, and you add one more point here, okay? 
doesn't look very dramatic, right? It's a three-point compactification of a straight line, right? The green thing is the familiar straight line, the very first variety we saw at the beginning of this course, and there's an obvious three-point compactification. But this theorem says this works for any sub-variety, any very affine variety in a torus over any valued field. Okay. This requires a little practice, right? So uh, if you do this maybe in a three space, on a three-dimensional projective space, and this green line is maybe a plane, you know, this requires practice, okay, to actually do this compactification. Now here's the question. I promised the theorem and the question. So here's the question. That's the question is 631. So I'm jumping into the next section. I'm going to ask the following question, which is the premise of that section. Which torus orbits of the toric variety does such a closure intersect? Now I haven't really spoken in my short presentation of toric geometry about the orbits, but the orbits on a toric variety are indexed by the cones in the fan. Right? So if you have a fan, for example up there you have this red fan with nine cones of different dimension, they correspond to the nine torus orbits on P1 times P1. So the two dimensional torus acts on P1 times P1 and it has a uh, nine orbits, four zero-dimensional orbits corresponding to the full-dimensional cones, four one-dimensional orbits corresponding to the rays, and one two-dimensional orbit corresponding to the origin. So the nine red cones correspond to the nine torus orbits, and of course readers of invitation to nonlinear algebra know this very well, that the orbits correspond to the faces of the polytope for a projective toric variety. So, so now we have a toric variety, let's say it's projected. Maybe let's say sigma is the normal fan of a polytope and we're building this toric variety. Now this toric variety has a million cones. Now there's a million red cones. One million red cones. Okay. Now some low dimensional sub-variety Z comes along, right? And you know, the question is, which of these million cones do, does the closure actually meet? Right? Which of these million strata on some high dimension? So why is million, right? So if, if we take a projective space of dimension 20, right, there's a million orbits, more than a million orbits. Right? But now we have this sub-variety. You have like maybe a three-dimensional sub-variety of a 20-dimensional projective space, and its closure will not meet all the million cones. It might meet only 258 cones. Right? This is called complexity reduction. Right? We want to reduce the complexity, and here's how we're going to do it. So answer, and that's theorem 6.3.4. It says it meets those cones, or those orbits whose cones, whose relatively open Cones. So these are polyhedral cones, and now I take the relative interior, so the relatively open cones intersect non-trivially with trop Z triv. Okay. So I have to explain Z triv. So Z triv means it's the same classical variety Z, except I take my field now with a trivial valuation. Right? So I have this field, but I forget the valuation. So Z triv is just the same variety but the field of, so this becomes a fan. So this trivial valuation. So this is really the, the recession fan of trip, trip, uh, trop Z. So trop Z is a polyhedral complex, and, and uh, this is the recession fan. So the theorem says I only have to look at those cones that meet um, the recession fan. Now again, I'm in 20-dimensional space. I have a million cones. But this three-dimensional sub-variety maybe has very, very few cones in its tropicalization, and the ones that it meets are those with the recession fan. So here we can see exactly that, right? So here there's only, this toric variety has nine orbits, but only one, two, three of those nine. Think of three as a really small number, nine is a very big number, right? Only very few are being met, okay? So that's the answer. 
Now with that in mind, I recommend, highly recommend, the detailed study of the following example. This is example 637. And there we work out exactly this picture, but tiny bit higher dimensional. So Z is a plane in T4. Okay? And we take Y to be Z bar in P4. So I take a system of two linear equations and I look at this either in the torus or in projective force space and I want to verify everything I said here, right? So, so that's my variety and then Z bar it's this closure in projective force space, right? So I'm going from here to here by adding five hyperplanes at infinity and then that adds some stuff to my planes. Now what is this? So trop Y is a compact surface inside trop P4. But trop P4 is the four dimensional simplex. The global quotient construction that makes P4 tropicalizes easily and gracefully and makes tropical P4 and tropical P4 is its polytope. Right? It's a four dimensional simplex. Now what is it? Let me highlight this. This I claim is the usual plane So Z bar, or trop Z bar, so it's the usual plane, let me say trop Z, tropical plane, compactified, by five trees. So I stick on five trees at infinity. So, uh, so that's it, right? So just take this green thing, double the dimension. Take the red ambient space, double the dimension. Now you have a green tropical plane, unbounded, not compact. In fact, all, almost all cells will be not compact. They're called flaps, what do we call them? Flaps and wings and cones and you glue them, to, you cut them out, you glue them together and you make this tropical plane. But now in tropical projective space this is a compact plane and in this compactification you simply glue on five tropical lines and these are tropical lines in a tropical P3. The tropical P3 is called a tetrahedron and you took at the five tetrahedra that are the facets of the four dimensional simplex and you simply Take the closure. And this beautiful, powerful theorem, 6218, says this is compatible with taking the risky closure on the classical algebraic variety. Okay, so this is all I want to say. So some of you saw that in an example in the discussion session on Tuesday. Everybody is invited to come to next Tuesday's discussion session, and we'll take a five minute break after your questions and then we'll embark on the last lecture on geometric tropicalization. So are there any questions from you or maybe from the chat box? Exactly, this lives in should have said that. This lives in R to the, did I say N or S? I think N here in this notation. This lives in R to the N. But if every coordinate of Z is non-zero, then the video evaluation will just map all of Z into one, 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 one. No, no, no. The tropicalization is, is the usual minimum is attained twice, right? So if I have a variety, if I have polynomials, all of whose coefficients have valuation zero, I still have the fundamental theorem, right? 
and I still have minimum is attained twice, right? So the tropical Grassmannian is a very interesting space, right? Um, so you still have a very interesting variety. So for example, this line might be the origin, right? You could take the equation x plus y plus one equals zero, right? Every coefficient has valuation zero and you still get this green line, right? So you have a fan, a non-trivial fan, and we're talking about the compactification of this fan. So you, you compactify a fan by gluing on, you know, appropriate pieces at the various infinities. Well, if you think that this fan represents a, uh, a matroid, right, then uh, what you see is infinity of various uh, sub-objects obtained by uh, com complete, you know, deletion and contraction. So you can really think of this you know, also in, in metroidal terms. Okay, other questions? Yes. Um, no, I don't think any of this is obvious. <laughs> so this is not obvious. It's actually explained in, in, in section 6.1. But no, I don't think it's obvious. It, require, it requires some thought, right? Because you're really introducing to, well, it's a formal mechanism. All you do, you throw in all these infinity coordinates. You have some polytope that you don't yet know, right? But you throw in an infinity coordinate, one infinity coordinate for each facet. And this infinity coordinate, right, you go far out. You go infinitely, infinitely. So there's a metric, right? These are still, you know, these are still rays that go infinitely out, right? It's the one point. You go out and out and out and infinitely far. It's a one-point compactification. You really go far out, right? But uh, that, that's measured by the infinity. So then you have... S facets, and you have an infinity coordinate for each facet. And then the magic of the structured Cox ring, the combinatorics that's codified in B and in the grading. So the grading of H and the irrelevant ideal B knows all the combinatorics of the polytope. So, so to answer your question, it is not obvious that we get the polytope, but it is encoded in the Cox ring with its combinatorial structure. No, 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 it's systematic. You always get the polytope. So projective space will be a simplex. A product of projective lines will be a cube. Um, you know, LSSM friends will get the permutahedron. I mean, you, get, you, you recover the polytope you think it is, but it comes uh, from this construction, from the tropicalized global quotient construction. It's a funny way to construct the polytope, right? So you construct the polytope by a global quotient of additive abelian groups. OK, so this did go over time, as I promised last time. But let's still take a five-minute break and then the last lecture.